Good morning, everybody, or afternoon and evening. I don't know why I said morning. I guess it's here morning. Um, welcome back to my channel. My name is Victoria Nicola, um, and I'm a writer, and I love to chat, talk to writers. Today, I have another wonderful writing friend, Elizabeth Blackwell. Welcome. Um, <laughs> she wrote a fabulous book called Red Mistress, and um, I just, I love this book so much, and I really wanted to chat to her about especially because it is about the russian revolution and um i'm originally from russia so and i find the revolution there just such a fascinating topic because there's so much happening and um and so i'm excited to talk to you welcome elizabeth yes thank you so much for having me victoria oh my gosh so i guess first things first what inspired you to write this book um, great question. And honestly, it was a huge um, sort of leap of faith and, ri and risk in a way. Um, I'll just say I a really simple question. I wanted to know how did the Russian Revolution happen? Wow. <laughs> and as I um, soon realized, I mean, many, many, many books have been written on the subject. Yeah. Um, I was a history major in college, always fascinated by European history specifically. Um, 18th, 19th, 20th century. And for some reason, the Russian Revolution was just a topic that had never come up in depth in any of my classes. Yeah. And I've always been fascinated by um, dramatic historical events, you know, where kind of life changed almost overnight. Um, and um, I'd read a lot about the French Revolution and I just, you know, sort of started wondering just for myself out of curiosity, wow, um, you know, how did a country as <laughs> sort of traditional yeah. quote unquote yeah. traditional as Russia completely transformed within a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And what effect did that have on all the various people who live there? And you know, the effect was um not good for many of them. I, and yeah. I I'm I'm being very sort of um trite about it now. Yeah. But um I kind of just wanted an excuse to find out more. And as anyone who loves history sometimes you just there's a rabbit hole that you sort of start down and once you start researching, you kind of, that makes you want to find more. And um, I just, I kept getting drawn back and part of me kept saying, oh, you're a fool to take this on. Like, you're not a Russian history expert, right? I was really coming into it with no personal background at all. Like you, I'm sure gr have grown up hearing stories, um, which, which kind of really brings these events to personal life for you. For me, it just came through books and reading first person accounts um, of people who lived through it just made me say like, I, I want to tell this story, I want to go through this timeline. And by writing the book, it forced me to do my best to kind of explain the day to day reality of what it felt like for a person of this particular social class to live through. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating that you didn't have a lot of experience with it because you did such a wonderful job. Honestly, it was really good, um, really realistic. Um, and actually, I guess the other thing that I should ask is for you to briefly like summar not summarize necessarily, but just give us like a little blurb for those who maybe have yes. not read it so who they could go read it after yes. this. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, it really is the story of Nadia um, is my main character um, seen through her eyes and um, she's from a privileged, you know, aristocratic upbringing and lives um, that kind of um, privileged lifestyle with a, a, a nice home in St. Petersburg and a summer house and servants and, you know, takes it all for granted. Um, and her father has a favored position in society. And um, little by little, everything that she counted on her life sort of goes away. Um, people in her family die. Um, she loses everything literally because if you were um, any, any part of the aristocracy at that point, I mean, everything you owned was confiscated once the Bolsheviks took over. Um, and some people would just crumble under that. You know, I've lost everything, I'm, I'm done. But what many young Russians of her, of her time did was, you know, you adapt to things that you never thought you could adapt to. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of an underlying current um, within the story is just how do people remake themselves? Mm -hmm. So having gone through the upheaval of the revolution, Nadia reinvents herself and then 
And that allows her to then take on an identity as a spy later in 1920s Paris, which was a hotbed of um, Russian emigres and double dealing and um, someone who had learned to, to kind of create a new version of herself after the revolution mm -hmm. then was able to use that to her advantage later on. Mm -hmm. And so it's a revolution story, but it's also a spy, a spy story too. Yeah, and it's, I think all those stages are really, um, I mean, again, so well done. And so um, interesting, first of all, it's intriguing because it's a, it goes from barely making it through, um, literally just watching everybody you know practically either die or starve or some kind of tragedy and then becoming a spy for this country that essentially actually betrayed you and your family and um I think that's really I don't know that's just it, it just really well for me it hits home a lot because it, I you know my family went through you know that that although from a very different perspective because we weren't nobility but um uh, we kind of, we but I would a, love to hear, like, what were the stories that you heard from family? Well, so my family, we, um, we were all peasants, uh, but, you know, contrary to popular opinion, um, most peasants really loved the king, uh, the Tsar. They loved him a lot. They called him Badzushka, which is a really sweet name for father. Um, they had like a real, because they're very traditional, so they loved the, the whole structure they um and they also uh of course they were all serfs uh, up until the time they were serfs right they were serfs up until about 1860 which is roughly the time slavery ended in america so um I, that's basically my ancestry and um and then so from like 1860-ish to about 1917 that's you know barely over 50 years um they a lot of peasants managed to actually do something for themselves they they like started little factories they opened little businesses you know they managed to you know or expand their farms or whatever so they they were very hard-working people and so they managed to they were like small business owners in a way you know and so that's kind of like my my history so they were peasants that that had like little that made something for themselves like there was a textile yeah. company i think my great grandpa had and um I would say my great great grandpa at this point yeah um so and they were all um i'm sure you know Ruskulachvania, which is like the kulaks they they dekulakized i don't even know what the technical term in english is um the kulaks, <laughs> but yeah. right uh kulaks were considered rich peasants um but rich rich is like really an understatement it's like if you had a cow yeah. you were considered rich yeah. you know yeah. so um my that's where what my ancestry went through so they were considered a kulaks and they everything was confiscated as well and um you know so everything that they barely worked their tails off for the last 50 something years um was taken yeah. away and uh they were all shipped off to siberia um so there was a lot of exile happening yeah and um so in siberia you know the way they i don't know if people know what that actually means they literally stuff you in a train take you out to the middle of nothing and you know just jump dump you out and you just yeah. if you survive you survive if you don't survive you don't survive it's basically like execution without, without really trying to do anything you know mm -hmm. they just like yeah. get rid of you and yeah. so my um my particular like one particular and the reason i know this story is because his photo actually survived i have a great grandfather great great grandfather uh simon he is the one who had a little company and he was shipped off like to Siberia and he was exiled for 10 years and but he managed to survive and he came back after 10 years and a lot of them um a lot of the stories were lost uh because you know it's just there's no records people are trying to make it plus you can't really at this time you can't really say anything really against the government so people don't right. Right. People don't say anything, so they don't record the stories, don't keep the stories. And so, um, but he in particular was um, interesting. And then I had, um, uh, and a lot of them afterwards, some of them came back to the cities that they left and some of them moved to Uzbekistan. I had uh, my, my whole dad side of the family, they all moved to Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so they were all living in Tashkent, which is the capital of Uzbekistan. And that's basically where my, my 
fa my father was born, my grandfather was born. And so um, it was a little bit easier in those like um, adjacent re Soviet republics. The, the, the power wasn't, uh, the Soviet power wasn't quite as strong. Uh, and yeah. so it was a little easier to live there. And th the other thing that really um, uh, kind of made it very difficult for my family is that they were actually very religious. They were, um, and interestingly, so they were at that, at this time already, they were Protestants. So they, um, I have, so there were some, they were either all Orthodox at some point, um, or there was a different religion called Malakani. I don't know if you came across this. Not, yeah. So Malakani, I'm not familiar. <laughs> Malakani are like this um, very decentralized, you know, Germany had uh, the the Protestant kind of Martin Luther came and he, there was the re uh, Reformation and all that. And yeah. so, um, but Russia never had something so organized and so centralized. It was, but there was, was a big branch of Orthodox people who once they began to, not even once even they began to read, they, they actually left Orthodoxy um, and they called themselves, they separated and they called themselves Malakani. And um, this have the, like, the, the first accounts of this are, you know, go back to Catherine the Grey and they were, um, they, they didn't really know what to do with them. So they kind of like left them in their like little villages, sequestered okay. kind of like in a, in like a, yeah. And they they kind of made them live together and just, you know, procreate and leave everybody else uh, alone. Leave <laughs> yeah. Leave us alone. Cause you're weird. You're, you're like did doing your own weird thing. But then yeah. once there were these, um, I think later in the 19th century, there were um, missionaries that came from England um, and they were the ones who kind of um, introduced this wave of Protestantism, different branches of Protestantism, mostly baptism. <clears throat> and, um, and so they, uh, a lot of people either changed from orthodoxy directly into Protestantism or they went from Malagani to Protestantism because they, it was, or baptism specifically. So my aunt, that was like a really long story, but my ancestors were essentially uh, Baptist. And so because they were religious and they were a unique version of religion, they really got a lot of persecution. Um, so they had it handed to them. You know, I have quite a bit of, um, you know, tragic stories where people were imprisoned for faith, even my, uh, uh, even up until my grandfather, that was, you know, in the, um, when my dad was born, he was uh, about seven or eight, I think his father was imprisoned for um, a good amount. Of, I mean, nothing crazy. I think he was supposed to be there for a really long time, but they let him out after three years or something. Um, so there's like a lot of this like tragic, it's just like one tragedy after another. I, I don't, I don't even know how my family managed to survive all these years, all these decades. But, um, and I actually wanted to, and I think the reason I really loved your story, obviously it's because it hits home, but you know, it's one of those, I always had it in my mind. Like I would like to write maybe like inspired by my ancestors survival kind of stories, like a, a conglomerate of different stories, maybe into one yeah. character, you know? Yes. yes. And you should, and believe me, I mean, about 20,000 times while writing this book, I was like, I, I can't, what am I doing? This, I mean, writing about Russian history, I mean, there's so much, right, that you can get into. And yeah. um, obviously, amazing novels have been written. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, and it so, sometimes feels like the, the bar is like crazy high, yeah. but I would really encourage you take the leap, go for <laughs> it, especially if you have an emotional connection, right? Yeah. And you don't have to be writing your literal family story. That's the wonderful thing about historical fiction. You can say, these are the facts that I want to include, <laughs> but I mean, completely right. Um, these are the, whatever, here's the type of character I want. Yeah, to to wind through these particular events, um, I would encourage you to. If it sounds like you know, that would be very fulfilling to you once you were done. Yeah, <laughs> difficult <laughs> to write once you were done. It would you exactly. Know, you'd, you'd be really I, glad you did it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's usually how an undertaking like this goes. You know, halfway through, yeah. you're just cursing yourself, pulling your hair yeah. out, going, "Why did I even start?" Yeah, and yeah. then when you're done, you're just so ecstatic. Um, well, the other thing that I wanted to kind of, I mean, I really wanted to uh, 
chat about a little bit about how what I really liked about your book also is the stages of um, the whole the entire thing like the pre-revolution there was a lot of this um, naive idealism about what a revolution would be like um, and you do that so well with Sergey, who is uh, the uncle of the main character and um, so technically he's a nobleman um, he's privileged and he has these lofty ideas of what it would be like to to live like I don't know in some utopic version of in, that's in his head um, and so I think that was really fascinating and then watching his kind of him kind of devolve as as it progresses and it doesn't turn out the way he wanted and like his you know his family dies and on and on and he tried to adapt as well but didn't really work out so well for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's had such a good history lesson. Those utopic ideals, they get you in trouble sometimes or most of the time. Yeah, and but but they're lovely, right? And they are lovely. It, 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 in theory. Yeah, in theory, <laughs> or, in theory, it's always nice. Or in limited practice, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who have those utopic ideas are, are inspiring people, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah and artists and writers and this whole character of Sergei, there were many, many people like him. Yes, he came from a rich background, but he thought of himself as, you know, bohemian and not not just Russian, but I'm, you know, a man world. of the world, right? Yeah. Right, and there's, oh, there have always been people like that and, and they can be really inspiring and they do change culture in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Through art. But when you have that idealism combined with, a movement that is really, really ruthless. Um, I think what I what I learned certainly through writing this book is we think Russian Revolution and you sort of think, oh, people riding in the streets and then Lenin was in charge. Yeah. And there were lots of stages. There were many stages along the way yeah. where if certain things hadn't happened, it would not have gone so badly. Yeah. There were many, many people who believed in communism who were not Bolsheviks. They exactly. were two different things. Right. And so there were stages along the way when it was, we want more, you know, the people want more power. Um, okay, the czar is deposed. They tried to have a democratic government. <laughs> you know, people were trying to, yeah. to kind of give power, legitimate power to the people. And, but there was this small group of people led by Lenin, the really hardcore Bolsheviks, yeah. who just kind of took advantage of the chaos, right? And they were not popular. They were not popular among the peasants, as you were saying, you know, the regular people. Um, they were not popular among really most, even communist socialists. They yeah. were like a fringe, hardcore group. Yeah. Um, but they were just, I'm going to say awful enough. I mean, they were willing to do anything. They right? were effective in their violence. And they were effective. <laughs> yeah. And so they sort of took power and, and you know, like, characters like Sergei who were so um, pleased and thrilled at first yeah um, they're they're the first ones to go down and be imprisoned and and yeah. um, executed etc and a few managed to just again you adapt you hang on you do the best you can under the circumstances mm -hmm. um, but yeah it, it happens in many revolutions <laughs> something yeah. to keep in mind yeah. you can start off with the best of intentions but look out who is also like marching with you exactly but it doesn't really have the same ideals <laughs> exactly and the other that's that's whenever I like I think that's the importance of studying history is is, is yeah. being tethered to the ground of uh yeah. of like what is actually possible you might have your ideas you might have your ideals and utopic visions and all um yes. but kind of bringing it back to okay but what is actually realistically possible in our world like are we evolved enough to actually implement something like this or are we still a little yes you know, slightly better than chimpanzees who could like yes. really, you know, Very destroy true. each other. Do you know what I mean? Um, Very true. Very I just, true. It's, it's just, I think, because I hear even nowadays, you hear so many different, like it, society should be this way and it should be yes. that way. And, you know, these, yes. these lofty ideals, it's just so common. And I feel like it's also very cyclical. I feel like every about oh, yes. hundred years, there's like yes. a huge movement to really um, change society. And, again it's admirable but those people 
you know, it would behoove them to read a Russian Revolution novel, if not, you know, a history yes. textbook to kind of understand. Yeah. It's just like, let's keep our feet on the ground. Let's take yeah. human nature into account. Yeah. And um, because I think that's really, I think it's human nature is, a, I think it's a very, I don't think it's like all dark or all light. I think it's a very intermixed and people will yeah. speak. Uh, personal success and, and there will be greed and there will be a lot of ego involved and that is never taken into account by these um, yeah. idealists in a way and again you, you know I think what people kind of um, forget is yes there were all first of all there was all these stages but second of all there was technically two revolutions there was the the revolution of deposing of the Tsar, and then the provisional government was established and then there was the bolshevik revolution months later so there were technically two instances where it got derailed so had the provisional government made it maybe it would have been yes. much better it probably yes. would have been much better yes yes yeah and and the other thing that um I think that actually makes the next point, which I really want to talk to you about, is this like, unfortunately, as much as I wish the revolution never happened, I understand in many ways why it did. And this like decaying noble class that became kind of useless, you know, like they're just, they're so, they've had it easy for so long. They didn't have to work for it. Nothing ever really threatened them because of the authoritarian regime of the Tsar and and when this actually started to happen and de get derailed, I think they just didn't, they didn't understand with what brutality the opposition was operating. They didn't understand because it was like too uncivilized for their like noble sensibilities, you know? And, yeah. and the same thing later on when um, Nadia goes to Paris and she meets all these um, refugees, essentially there's emigre, uh, 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 there's noble people who are technically related to her even. Um, and they're just so useless. All they do is they talk about like what could be, oh, this government's not going to make it. And they don't like do anything. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the most, most interesting facts that told a lot to me about the aristocratic world of that time, they all spoke French. Yeah. Many of them didn't speak Russian, you know, yeah. and, and it's sort of shocking to think about that now. Yeah. <laughs> But they literally were in their own world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it was, again, very kind of European mm -hmm. and French and, and English. A lot of them had British nannies and British governesses because that was all England was also very mm -hmm. sort of aspirational living. Mm -hmm. So they spoke English and French, beautiful English and French and, and very not Russian, Russian or hardly, you know, terrible Russian to order the servants around, I, I, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or they'd tell the butler in French and he would order them around in Russian. Um, it just, it's sort of shocking in, in, in a way you hear stories mm -hmm. like that and you're like, of course there was a revolution. Like how long could that keep going on? Yeah. Um, and however um, sophistic sophisticated they were in terms of music and art and et cetera, um, they were not living in reality. Exactly. And there's a really small scene in my book which is also based on a, a really amazing account that I read where there would be these sort of quote unquote villages mm -hmm. on some aristocrats land. And there, there were hovels. I mean, people mm -hmm. were, you know, the serfs, the peasants, even, mm -hmm. even when they were no longer technically serfs, like you mm -hmm. said, there were some small businesses, yeah. but they were, um, they were really living in horrible, really pretty basic circumstances. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, across the woods would be this beautiful mansion. Yeah. There were no really towns. Yeah. There were sort of, little hovels where the poorest people lived and did the best they could mm -hmm. and then these huge estates and kind of not really anything in between yeah. like you would see in England or France little village you know cute little villages yeah. etc right. so there was such a huge gap mm -hmm. between the rich and poor just enormous mm -hmm. and a rich character like Nadia normally would not even see where the poor people who worked her father's land she wouldn't even see where they lived mm -hmm. she'd never go there you know mm -hmm. um so again, you, you hear, you sort of hear stories like that and you say, yeah, okay. I like, <laughs> I can understand how this, this system was not sustainable mm -hmm. in let's say the modern world. It was sustainable, like you said, a long time with yeah. autocracy, yeah. A, a land of Kings and, and ultimate power, but yeah. coming into the 20th century, um, you know, things were changing that could not be maintained that sort of. Exactly. Status. 
Exactly. Yeah. And I've long thought like, what could have possibly happened to have prevented the revolution from, you know, taking the path that it did. And I really think that it, the, the changes, like the, the freeing of the serfs in the 1860s came way too late. It needed to have happened like under Catherine the Great or something, you know? Um, yeah. And uh, it's like, it's a, it's a tragedy really that it didn't because she was such an enlightened technically ruler and she did a lot, but she didn't uh, free the serfs. And I think if, had she done that, there would have been a century extra of, yes. um, of, well, practically a century extra, not necessarily all the way extra century, but there would have been a lot more time for um, less of this like bitterness to brew. And um, yes. and also had had maybe, I think it was, I think it was uh, the same emperor, the same Tsar, this uh, Alexander, I think it's Alexander II who, who, who um, freed the serfs. He was about to sign a, um, he was about to sign a some kind of decree that would make Russia a uh, a constitutional monarchy where there would be a, uh, a an actual uh, what what am I looking for like a representative a, some semi representative government of yes yes of the people yeah. and he was assassinated he was assassinated by some uh, rebel who uh, just couldn't wait and that's the other thing this is like. I feel like people who are these revolutionaries, they just like, they get in their own way many, many times. They trip you over their own actions. And had yes. that not have happened, we would have had an extra 50 years of a constitutional monarchy. And it would have probably been much better because interestingly enough, the next Tsar over um, was really authoritative. And I mean, practically rescinded everything with the exception of like not, to taking the serfs back you know into chains but um so i just i don't know just watching the entire like the last 150 years of russian history of the the tsarist regime it's just really uh, a sad really sad affair because it's just one misstep after that after then another. and also don't yeah don't underestimate the effect of of war the fact that it happened yeah. Exactly. After World towards the War. end of World War One, I, I I personally had not made that connection before writing this book, but it it goes into what we're saying about the vast um, society uh, inequality. Yeah. <laughs> Is that you know Russian soldiers were dying at just horrendous yeah. rates. They in, in many many cases didn't have boots. They didn't have guns. They were having to take bullets out of their dead comrades you know, weapons to yeah. try to defend themselves. Yeah. And who was running the army? It was the aristocratic families because you got, you know, the, the, the higher your, your rank in society, the higher your rank in the, in the okay. military, no matter what your actual experience was. Yeah. And so could there be a more harsh contrast between some yeah. out of touch, yeah. inept leadership at the top that didn't know how to like get supplies to their mm -hmm. soldiers Mm -hmm. And then these poor conscripted soldiers from the poorest families yeah. dying in miserable circumstances um, without adequate supplies. In, and in many cases, it was their wives. Oh, and then because they were not at home to work the fields, there was yeah. not enough food for their families. So, yeah. you know, yeah, it, it was just add so in wrong. a cataclysmic world war <laughs> and anything that is already unstable in your society, um, that's like, lighting yeah. a match and you know tossing it on there. exactly exactly I mean yeah. we kind of have been seeing it in the last like you know ever since I feel like there were already brewing tensions and then the last two years of the pandemic it just like you know match onto it that stack. that's it right things were already like sort of like simmering and it was like oh let's like throw some extra oil on there yeah exactly yeah exactly. yeah <laughs> And I feel like it's so sad. I mean, obviously there's all this international trauma happening right now with Russia and Ukraine and this, this invasion and war. And uh, we just had a family friend who came from Russia. I don't even know how he managed to come for a visit. I, I, I mean, he, I don't know. But anyways, we just hosted a friend who's from Russia. And um, he was saying, um, he was saying like, you know, because we were asking him all these questions, like, what are people thinking? What's going on locally and all that? And, you know, it's he and uh, all of 
his congregation, um, cause he's a deeply, um, Christian human man. And so he, he goes to, he's part of this big church and congregation and he's just like everybody, you know, people are against it. And the other thing is that he was saying, the problem is that a human life is not worth much in Russia and it never has been. And it, it like, it, it drove that point home from like, from centuries ago, it, it was the same during World War One and the same during the Revolutionary War and World War II and the same with the centuries prior. You know, that's why Russia managed to be so big because they didn't care. They just kept throwing innocent serf and peasant kids as soldiers to conquer their lands. And so yeah. it's, it's a very strange, you know, Russia is a strange country in many ways it's, it's a there's so much beautiful culture there and then at the same time there's this contrast of like authoritarianism and this like dark backbone essentially to the country yeah. and yeah. you know I don't know why I don't know why it's there but it's there and it's been there for yeah. a long time and I just hope, uh, you know, with current events, so many people <laughs> that don't know all <laughs> the background and yeah. all the subtleties. Um, yeah, I hope this doesn't become, you know, evil Russia. <laughs> yeah. You know, because yeah, I um, mean, there I, were hints of that for sure. I mean, in the beginning, I, I, I'm like, I oh, this is going to be bad. <laughs> it's getting a little more nuanced, you know, yeah. I, I, I hope, I think most people understand that it's not, you know, everyday Russian people. Yeah. You exactly. know, I am super excited and cheering it on yeah I'm, I'm sure most russians like yeah they're also not going to protest in the streets right for exactly. very understandable they're, reasons yeah self-sustained they just want to live their life yeah. right do, do yeah. their day-to-day -day business like most people do yeah um and yeah it's unfortunate when sometimes stereotypes take over and you forget just yeah because it, it's it's a simplistic way of thinking it's easier to think like this good this bad um and yes. uh, it, you know the nuance is very it's like the first thing that goes during war because nobody's gonna yes. sit there like if someone's shooting at you it's like oh do these people really want to be shooting at me you know no one's gonna i and yes. i understand that that's it's it's everybody's just trying to survive and yeah but i i do think that there is a little bit of um a little maybe a little more nuance now happening because even um so because right now what is happening is if Ukrainians manage to make it to Mexico, America just lets them in with a Ukrainian passport as a refugee. Um, but and that and they didn't, but they didn't allow anybody with a Russian passport, which is um, difficult because there's a lot of Russians living in Ukraine that are also fleeing their homes, right? Because they're yes. citizens of Russia. Because yes. again, these countries are really, really intertwined, and what's happening is a tragedy. Yes. Um, and so now I guess starting in some date in April where they're going to be letting people with Russian passports in as refugees as well so there is like even on the, like the state level hopefully there's a little mm -hmm. bit of you know more nuanced understanding of like what's happening and um yeah it's it's just again it's like watching history play out before our eyes right now and it's just yes yeah yes it's kind of an interesting tragic perspective yeah, but one of the one of the underlying themes of of the book as I was writing it and deciding you know which which characters I really wanted to include was the resilience <laughs> of everyday Russians. Yeah. I mean, you know, generations of suffering, <laughs> yeah. but people find a way to mm -hmm. keep going. Yeah. And even if it was in small ways, like I have a minor character based in reality, you know, someone who was a prince in Russia. Mm -hmm who never drove it's like well I can be a taxi driver in Paris because that was one of the few jobs that they let yeah. foreigners do yeah um you know okay like I'll drive a taxi if that's what it takes yeah. um countless families who left Russia with literally nothing like okay I'll take my chances in America yeah right yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I have nothing I don't speak the language yeah you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do that or, or whatever it was, or um, I'm staying in Russia and I'm keeping my head down and I'm going to do my best not to be arrested, but help people where I can. Yeah. People found just everyday Russians found all sorts of ways yeah. to get by day by day. <laughs> and I think there's a depth of um, hmm, toughness. I mean, <laughs> toughness that a lot of Americans 
don't have or quite understand because we as a society have not had to live through a, a lot of those challenges. We have not had world wars on our land, yeah, for example, exactly. um, in the last hundred years. So, um, so I think I have just such great admiration mm -hmm. um, for the ways that so many people in, in the, in the books that I read, just, they found ways to, to make a life, yeah. whatever yeah. the circumstances were and sort of like, keep going, don't give up, don't give in to like despair. Yes. Be admirable. <laughs> It is, it is, it is very, um, I think, I think in a way that's where a lot of the stereotypes come from, like Russians never smile and they're just mean and like all these like, uh, th this like tough stuff, which I mean, I understand where it could come from because, you know, in the street, people are less smiley at you, but they've had <laughs> all these insane, I mean, they're, these tragedies have basically forged a little bit of their culture. And so, um, and and still, you know, people try to. Of course, once you get to know them, then they're they're great and friendly and laughing and everything. Um, it's just that there is, you know, this undercurrent of a lot of, um, you know, tragedy, life lost, um, just not a constant insanity. Really, like, um, I mean even in, yeah, again, in my own family, I just think, I mean, we came as refugees from the Soviet Union in 91. We came like a few months right before the Soviet Union left, uh, fell. Um, and, and the reason we came is because again, the religious persecution and all that. And, um, but my, so we only had, my family only had the opportunity to come in the, um, 90s right before like right when the uh, gates began to open wow. and more people can try to um, leave yeah. but wow. it, it was still like you couldn't just go to the airport and buy a ticket to get on an airplane and leave you know the way we do it now you had to have like a connection to even get access to an airplane to get to all this stuff so my parents had to like do their magic and um and bef before that like even um a like a few of my friends and fam families uh, that we know had to go through like china or they had to go to italy for a little bit and stay there for a few months and then come to america or wherever they, they decided to end up um so i have you know friends like that um but my grandpa right like around the time when he was um taken to prison when my dad was only eight uh, so that's like, oh gosh, let me see in the sixties. Um, he told my grandma, even then he's like, if you get an opportunity to leave, just leave, leave me in prison, just go with it. Like they had yeah. five kids, just take the kids, leave. I'll find you when I get out, you know? So there was this constant, like, again, this theme of like, just get out, just survive, just do, you know, um, I don't know. It, do, what you, do what you gotta do. Yeah. Do what you gotta do. It's it's do what you yeah. gotta do constantly just to make it through. And um uh so yeah, and again, you're right about the the um the resilience. So that's that's wonderful that you were able to portray that as well. Yes. I mean, even the way, even the way Nadia, like how her mother passed, you know, and she she was sick and like and they were literally in the same room and it was, oh, it was just so tragic. And she just like, like has to move on. Like, what can she do? You know? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, Thank you. Yeah. It's really, it's so, yeah, again, great. And then, um, what was I going to say? Yeah. Back to the, the naive, noble, <laughs> noble people, <laughs> noble men. I mean, it's great that they managed to, um, some of them managed to actually like go out there and, and get like these jobs where they were able to be taxi yes. drivers. But then yes. um, this interesting ideal of like, no, it's going to change. And some of them refused to speak Russian even because they felt so betrayed by their country. You know, they yeah. just continued to speak English or French or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not always easy to reinvent yourself, and and certainly a, a fascinating, you know, sort of second part of the book takes place mostly in the 1920s, and it's interesting to realize at that time, you know, people didn't know how history was going to go. Yeah. So a lot of people thought the Bolsheviks would fail in a couple of years, right? Yeah. And so there were people who totally totally thought, okay, I'm going to wait out my time in Paris, yeah. <laughs> right? And it'll all fall apart and I'll go back in. Um, that was that was not an unrealistic thought at the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, there were lots of people who thought, um, 
on, on the contrary, that um, communism is going to spread. <laughs> and there was a yeah. huge fear in France and in England yeah. that, oh my gosh, now all our, you know, yeah. lowly paid factory workers are going to rise up because they see what happens in Russia. Yeah. So that's another thing when you write historical fiction, you have to put yourself in the mindset of characters mm -hmm. who don't know where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. And in the 20s, especially in Paris, when there were so many kind of different nationalities and dealing behind the scenes for possible power, yeah. um, there was a lot that just still felt very, very up in the air. Um, and I did find that pretty fascinating to think that, again, things could have changed in 1925. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And you're right about that. Um I actually really appreciated that as well because it's absolutely true. It's fresh. Who knows where it's going to go? It's led by a bunch of, like I said, brutal, brutal people and also uneducated people. Really, a lot of them were um, not educated. The reason that they managed to, of course, there were people like maybe Alec, who was Nadia's husband, who was a revolutionary and all that, and um, a psychopath, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Even the psychopaths, no, I have to have some sympathy for. Well, that's, you raise a really interesting point here. You're a writer of historical fiction too. Um, one of the biggest challenges is you want to write characters that are true to their time. And yet the modern reader yeah. cares about in some way. Even, even if caring means I care that something bad happens to them because they're awful, if you see yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. And I'm sure you have heard, I have read books that are set in the past yeah. where the characters talk like no. they're alive today. And that I'm sure you, you, you know, you tell the difference. It's not mean that you have to use archaic language. You know, you can write in modern day, you know, colloquial English, but you have to, the character's behavior has to align with that world, even if they are fighting against the limits of that world or whatever. Um, and that's always a very delicate balance. And I knew I could make Nadia a sympathetic, char sympathetic character, even though at the beginning, yes, yeah, she's rich and privileged and spoiled, but, you know, redeems herself along the way, learns, grows, changes, etc. cetera. Um, but there is this character. I, I felt very strongly there needed to be a hardcore Bolshevik yeah. character um, who she eventually marries. And I, am, I, I did my very best to explain why he was the way he was. Um, I'm not going to say he's a warm, lovable teddy bear of a, of a character, but there had, it had to be believable that Nadia would marry him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Someone who has lost everything because of the Bolsheviks. Why would she marry a top Bolshevik? You have to read the book to find out, but I you have to make that believable. You have to make him his reasons for his actions believable in his own mind. Yeah. Um, and that is, that is one of the challenges of writing historical fiction. But um, I think it's really important to be able to do that and not just have the cartoon bad guys because we now know, oh, yeah, he yeah, was so many people died under your power, you're bad. A hundred percent. No, I actually think you do, a, a, again, a, a lovely job with making him so believable. He's very... I mean, I understand his motivations and I understand yeah. his um, his distaste and even hate for the aristocracy. The reason I actually think that um, he's a little, the reason I said he was psychopathic isn't even because of that, is because he had, like when he visited, had visited Nadia and her family um, before the oh, revolution yeah. and he was like really flirty with her mom and then he proposes to her later. That's where I was like, okay, this guy has like a weird fetish with <laughs> noble ladies. Absolutely, fair point. And, and yes, I, I can totally see that. A hardcore right. revolutionary at the same time kind of being like, ooh, this rich, this rich lady. Yeah, is it's, a, yeah and it's a type That's of power. Cool. It's a type of power for him yeah. probably. Like, oh yeah, yeah we're going to take over and we're going to even take over in this sense, this like most primal yeah. sense. Um, yeah. And good point. Uh, yeah, and then I actually, um, I actually do even, there is like a sense of feeling bad for Alec in the, the way he, his story ends as well, you know, because uh, again, even the, even the Bolsheviks themselves who were brutal and clearly very loyal to the party, the minute that they even show like an instance of stepping out of some 
uh, somebody who's over them out of line, that's it. Like they don't, there's, they don't mess around. And so a lot of these people who started the revolution ended up executed. And yes. um, again, that's the, that's the irony of all of this. So, yes. oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, is that, you know, and th- that's where you kind of like, despite yourself where you're like, you caused this chaos and all this bloodshed, you and your naivety, you were still naive enough to think that this is going to sustain you. And it turned against you, you know? Um, and I actually know, like to this day, I know some people who are um, Marxists or whatever, you know, like they they have their theories and, and in my head, I'm like, well, that's cute. I think that's great for you. Keep it in theory. And also because in reality, you're like, these are people I love. Like, so I know what good people they are. I'm like, in reality, you'd be the first on the chopping block if this <laughs> actually happened. <laughs> like, it, it just, I just, I'm a realist when it comes to these things, you know? Yeah. So it's yeah. just not, um, I just don't have that idealistic bone anymore of, I don't know. Well, then you're, 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 <laughs> you're set for a career in historical fiction because I think, you know, you have to be realistic about what happened in human nature. Human nature, that human write nature. Good stories. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and um, I actually, um, I am, I actually wrote, I, I just finished um, my work in progress, which is a, um, it's it's a Russian history. It's technically it's about Kiev and Rus. So it's like real oh my gosh, middle way back, medieval, way back, yeah. <laughs> Which is uh, for those who don't know, it's the original kingdom that had united Russia and Ukraine, like the very like origins of the the the. Um, it was in Kiev, but it was Rus, so it was like this interesting conglomerate, and um, and it's uh set in 945 A.D. So it's like really medieval time, and um, it th- yeah, and it was really this was my first venture into historical fiction. And I don't know what made, what possessed me to want to go that far back because it's not like my cup of tea to like um, really do something like that. I really like more 18th, 19th century history. Um, but it's also very, um, it, it's like a really fascinating time in Russian history and Ukrainian history. And so I really wanted to kind of uh, I don't know, bring it to life. Cause it's very, it, it, the culture is still very Viking. Like they were Varangians, the, wow. the leaders, they were, um, so it had, it's, it's like this weird mix of Slavic, but also Northern, you know? And so, um, yeah, it's just interesting. That sounds uh, fascinating. Number one, I love that you said, uh, why am I doing this? Like you got caught up with this idea. Yeah. You found a time period where interesting things were happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And it kind of like, wouldn't let you go. <laughs> exactly. And it possesses you. And I love that it's a time period that I don't know much about. And, yeah. and I'm sure most American readers don't know much about. And I would love to see more stories from different eras like that. I mean, I love a medieval novel. I mean, I love suffering, sorry, you know, suffering downtrodden peasants and crumbling <laughs> castles and all that. I'm, I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but more settings like that, that yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's exciting. Thank you. Um, yeah. And so talk about trying to make characters realistic to that time because they were talk about being brutal again. They were, they were incredibly brutal back in the day and they were just, um, uh, I mean, it's such a different concept of life for them. You know, they just didn't, yeah. um, of course they would be sad if, somebody attacked their family, but it was very much about this loyalty. Um, and then on top of that, life of everybody else was deemed very little and you just, you could easily go and take and, and kill whoever you need to kill in your way. It was, it was a yeah. brutal existence. And so um, trying to make characters sympathetic who would actually end up murdering a lot of people, not murdering in our modern sense, but like killing them for their whatever, reasons you know for their historical reasons and so um um still making them sympathetic and uh, yeah it's it's a really it's a really tough kind of just trying to (laughs) slither navigate that navigate that exactly yeah um but yeah I, I mean are you thinking of any other um I don't know are there any other 
history novels that you're thinking of writing in, in Russian history or any other? Yeah, you know, I I'm I'm I jump around. <laughs> so some very successful historical fiction authors kind of find their era uh -huh. and and stay there. And God bless them because that's so much easier. <laughs> yeah, if you just dive deep into a particular place. World War II, some authors are making a great career yeah. just within yeah. World War II because there's so yeah. many different stories you can tell, yeah. right? Um, unfortunately for me, I have this, you know, the kind of brain that's always like jumping around. Um, so for me to keep motivated with writing, I'm, I'm kind of always moving around to different places. So mm -hmm. um, for my next book, I've again, I'm just finishing up it because, you know, good. COVID plus creative writing, for some reason, were not the best combination for me. Yeah. I was not super productive. I know, yeah. I know there were some people who were just like, I cranked out so much during COVID and good for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, I'm just finishing up right now. That's actually set in the 1970s. So it's a completely different era. And, and again, for someone of my age, just thinking of the 70s when I was, I was alive in the 70s. Um, <laughs> How can that be his history? But it, it is now, yes, it and is. it's it's kind of uh, younger readers are ac actually really interested in stories set then. I, I'm finding, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's in this 1970s sort of an international cast of characters in France, mm -hmm. and um, kind of a suspense murder mystery. A group of people get together and start dying off. So it's a combination. It's yeah, it's very different. <laughs> very different, but, but I love it. it. That's like it's my favorite waiting. murder mystery and history together. With, <laughs> well, like, <in> crossover. <laughs> me too. So this was my attempt. Yes. Uh, at that. And um, yeah, I just try, I, for me, I need to make it difficult for myself every single time by going <laughs> somewhere completely different. Yeah. Um, but I would, yes, theoretically, I would write another book set in Russia, like a, in an instant, like, because there, again, so much history, so many fascinating different time periods yeah. um, and talk about rich characters. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right, because there's so much Russian there. History. And there, yeah, within one society, you'll find everybody from like the privileged aristocrat to like the dreamer, yeah. artist, poet to, you know, the lowly peasants. So it's just yeah. so much there. Yeah, but that sounds yeah. fascinating. And um, when you said people start dying off, my immediate thought is like, and then there were none, Agatha Christie. Totally. That's completely one of my personal yeah. references and one of, one of my all time, I top 10 books. I would say for me yes yes I was such an Agatha totally. Christie I was I was obsessed with her when I I mean it was yes. I'm surprised I didn't start writing murder mysteries because that was like my I don't know feel good yeah. novel I just like loved to whodunit kind of books you totally know? Well, you can do that within. I might, yeah. <laughs> too. So just keep that in mind for the future too. <laughs> I might, yeah, I just yeah. might. Um, is there anything else that you want to add about uh, Red Mistress? Anything um, that we have? No, just thank about? you so much for, um, for your kind words. And as I said, I would just, as advice to any <laughs> struggling author, um, don't be afraid to take on the tough topics. Yeah. The, the topic that keeps nagging at you, even if you think, like I said, I'm not an authority. I didn't study Russian history. I don't have a Russian background. Who am I to do this? You have to put in the work. You have to put in the research. Yeah. I mean, I did years of reading before I even started writing the book. Um, so, but if you're willing to invest that time and it's a time period that interests you and keeps your interest as you're researching, um, go for it. And it can be really, really rewarding. I think if you if you approach a time period that you're just not, not that familiar with, um, you're more open minded, you know, and you discover things along the way that then find their way into the book and into your characters. So don't be afraid to take a risk. Write on the tough topic. Just you know, be prepared to be reading a lot of books beforehand in preparation, but it's worth it. Oh man, that's such good advice. Don't be afraid to yeah tackle those tough topics because it, you're right, it's so rewarding in the end. I mean, you you ended up with a fabulous, fabulous thank book. You. I just can't speak highly and like thank you. I think <laughs> so much. Thank you. And I wish I could have had that voice in my head like, <laughs> like four years ago when I was in the middle of it. Like, what am I doing? What? 
man. Everyone should have that invisible voice, like future readers' invisible invisible voice. Keep going, finish the book. (laughs) I mean, it was so, I mean, it was, to me, I even had to take, okay, and this is going to sound weird, like if if this is a weird compliment, but I had to take breaks from it because it was so um, emotional for me, you know, like I had to, yeah, so I had to like take breaks and just like, like recoup from like all the like sadness and then come back to it and read it but it's you you capture that spirit really well so thank um, you yeah that means so much especially coming from you um you know (laughs) with your own personal experiences um it's that that much more meaningful so thank you yes yes absolutely well maybe we can when is do you know when this new mystery come is coming out because i'd love to interview about that still a work in progress. I'll keep okay. you posted. Okay. Keep me posted. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Well, we'll definitely do this again because it was such a pleasure chatting to you. Thank and you. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, and uh, yeah, everybody, thank you so much for listening to us and please subscribe to this channel. I always forget to say that and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.